Right. Thank you for um, the invitation, and I'm glad to visit Nottingham. You have a beautiful campus. Um, this question mark I just added to the title, it's not something I gave Thomas previously, because since I gave him the title of the talk, I actually decided that I have a uh, missing piece of the evasion program. So I actually don't know um, the whole story. That, well, I never knew the whole story, but I have I thought I had a pretty good outline, and now there's really a missing link. So this talk is going to be uh, a summary of what the firewall puzzle is and why it's interesting and it's the essential thing that I think has been missing in all discussions of it pretty much so far which is the role of the Wheeler DeWitt constraint in quantum gravity and I'll explain why I think that's important and plays a crucial role but I won't conclude that that role is sufficient to um, explain the paradox because there's still some mystery. So uh, the reason this is interesting is um, it really pushes us kind of up against the wall with our beliefs about the basic outlines of quantum gravity. And even if you believe that string theory or just some generally covariant ultraviolet completion of general relativity other than string theory, uh, this argument seems to say that a black hole horizon can't be smooth. It can't be a regular location. There must be a firewall there, and I'll say what that is in a second. But nobody really, maybe one person, I've heard express the belief that that conclusion is correct. That is Rafael Busso. Um, and I don't know if he's just joking or if he really believes it. But I think pretty much everybody that's arguing that, there is a, uh, that there's no escape from the firewall argument doesn't really believe the conclusion. They just think that they don't see the escape from the argument. And so that's what makes it so interesting. And um, my feeling is that we don't really need to know that much probably in the end about quantum gravity to resolve it, uh, at least in its broad outlines. I'm thinking that because it's just such a blatant problem. So I'll tell you what that is. So what is the firewall that we're trying to evade? Uh, Let's draw a picture of a black hole horizon on one moment of time, on a time slice that cuts through the horizon. And somehow in the neighborhood of that horizon, there's supposed to be, instead of what you would normally think, which is that you have the vacuum state of quantum fields, at least on distance scales, small compared to the size of the black hole. Instead, you've got some very highly excited state Highly excited means there's a lot of energy there, and a lot of energy there means that if you fell across it, you would get burned up by high energy particles, hence the, the name firewall. And whether that uh, firewall is just a little bit outside the horizon or just a little bit inside or on the horizon or spread out how much is never specified by any of these arguments and nobody claims to know, as you'll see, the logic just of the, of the argument doesn't really tell you exactly where it is, but it just says it must be there. So maybe we should just draw it like this, uh, straddling the horizon. And the term firewall, uh, you know, I guess when I first heard it, what it brought to my mind was a wall of fire. So because high energy particles is like a wall of fire. But a firewall is also a barrier to information transfer like in a computer system. And so it's also a suitable word. I think this is why the authors of the name chose it, because its sort of role in the argument is to keep information from being lost into the black hole. And uh, it also sort of prevents information from escaping. But the key thing is it cuts off the inside, so you can't lose information. So that's the background, the terminology. Where does the argument come from? Well, uh, let's say we'll do it on this side. The local vacuum has correlated vacuum fluctuations in it. So we imagine that the state is the vacuum at small distances here. We could focus on a particular outgoing mode of some quantum field. And 
if this were Minkowski space-time and this horizon were just uh, an infinite plane that's an acceleration horizon for some observer, we would learn that the vacuum can be described as an entangled state between, uh, let's say, modes propagating away from that barrier um, on two sides of it, so like this. So this is correlated to that, and uh, we can write down an expression for the vacuum state of this mode, let's call it O, that's a sum over energies e to the minus en over twice the temperature, in this case the Hawking temperature of the black hole, times uh, the nth excited state of this mode, tensor the nth excited state of that mode. So I guess I should label it as kind of inside and outside, or um, So for a linear field, for a free field, we could just decompose it into separate modes and sort of for each mode that's strictly outgoing outside the horizon, it has this structure. Now, what happens in flat space is that these two guys just stay um, parallel to this horizon. If we draw it in space time, it would be like this. So the, the plane of the horizon is perpendicular to the board and we're talking about a mode propagating out like this and a mode propagating out like this on either side of this horizon. And these two, the quantum state of those two field degrees of freedom is entangled in this way. This is an entangled state. Now what's different in the case of a black hole is we don't have flat space, so something that's going out just outside the horizon eventually actually can climb away from the horizon at red shifts on the way, and the thing that's inside the horizon actually falls back into the black hole. The horizon is the dividing line between things that can escape and things that uh, fall back in. So these two get peeled apart, and what the Hawking effect is, is it's a kind of instability of the vacuum, where you end up with some particles, actual on-shell particles propagating away from the black hole with positive energy and correspondingly, because it's a stationary background, we have to conserve the notion of energy here. This uh, partner particle or field mode on the inside has a negative energy, so together they have zero energy. And so positive energy escapes from the black hole and somehow there's a quantum back reaction on the geometry that shrinks the mass of the black hole. And if that keeps going on forever, the black hole would eventually evaporate away completely. The state of the thing that escapes is thermal because of this factor. So there's a two there instead of a one just because it's not until we form the reduced uh, density matrix of this state, let's say tracing over the inside, that we get the state of the outside degrees of freedom. And that's just, you know, the probability of a given outside excitation number n is the square of this amplitude. So it's minus En over T, just the Boltzmann factor. So it's a thermal, a thermal mixed state of quanta that emerges from the black hole. That's the standard Hawking picture. So I think... That what kind of calculation leads to this vacuum state? Is it the standard Hawking calculation? Actually, the standard... You can think of this as a standard calculation in Minkowski space. It's, this, I think, the simplest way to conceive of it. So as long as, you know, let's draw a little uh, box around here. As long as this box is very small compared to the radius of curvature of the space-time, and uh, the local state of the field is, is locally the vacuum, then uh, we should be able to do the analysis in flat space and see what's the nature of that vacuum, and then put back in the effects of curvature afterwards. And that's when these guys get peeled apart by the tidal effects of the curvature. But the basic structure of the state is exactly the same as it would be in flat space. In flat space, of course, there's no Hawking temperature. So what plays the role of that is actually uh, the, um, it's h bar over 2 pi. It's a dimensionless boost temperature, but I don't want to get into that right now. So again, the key thing is this is an entangled state. 
And if we don't have access to the inside mode, then because of that entanglement, the state of the outside is mixed. That is in the sense of a quantum mechanical mixed state. It has entropy and you don't know what excitation level it's going to have and so it's a mixed state. So it looks like entropy is radiated by the black hole as the black hole evaporates. And if we made um, a plot of the entropy versus time of the radiation that's come out of the black hole entropy you know it would start at zero and it would grow and presumably when the black hole evaporates away completely it would saturate up to some maximum and people have analyzed this and the maximum is of the same order of magnitude as the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole in fact you know it's around it's an order order unity multiple it's a little bit bigger because evaporation into vacuum is an irreversible process so entropy is increases in that process I don't know I'm not being specific about the actual shape of this curve of course so that, that would be the story if uh, if you just analyze things according to quantum field theory in a curved background and assume that energy conservation implies that the black hole shrinks during the evaporation now if you believe on the other hand that the evaporation process must be unitary as viewed outside the black hole this can't be the right answer so um, by unitary I just mean let's say you can think of the whole thing as a scattering experiment you throw things in at high energy to a space-time and form a black hole and it evaporates emitting all this radiation and in the end you collect up all the radiation it's the state of it should be related to the initial state of the collapsing material by unitary transformation and if the collapsing material was in a pure state then all the radiation taken together must be in a pure state also so if that were true by the way there's no reason in my talk right now for you to think that's true but if that were true and I'll say why why you might think that's true in a moment but if, it, if it's true then this can't be right and at some point this must turn around and come back down to zero this thing is often called the page curve and the analogy you should have in mind is just something that has nothing to do with black holes it could just be a piece of paper you shine a laser on it let's say so see it's a paper in a pure quantum state and the laser is in a pure quantum state and you shine this laser on and the paper well, I guess we need some oxygen too <laughs> so I want the paper to burn up um, anyway we start with a pure quantum state of material that can just burn up and eventually it's going to look very thermal but secretly it'll be a pure state with uh, impossibly hidden correlations but strictly speaking the fine-grained entropy of that state should go back down to zero so for many years uh, there's been a sort of yeah would you Why oh, this would be a picture of the entropy of just the radiation that came out thank you for asking me that um, I still have the paper there it's burning so there's some uh, yeah, instead of burning paper I should just say heat up some ball of material that starts out in its ground state so then the radiation that's come out would be uh, entangled with the material left behind in and only finally at the end when the material left behind settles back down to its ground state would all of the radiation taken together be in a pure state again so this graph is just the radiation not the whole system so many people for from the beginning believe that black hole evaporation must be unitary so something like this must happen they believed it for various reasons that I won't go into except to say that I don't personally didn't buy any of them and another reason came along when ADS-CFT duality was discovered 
and that reason uh, personally I found it harder to ignore and it's a pretty convincing argument and then finally I became personally I changed my mind after 30 years of thinking that the, the top curve was the correct one I changed my mind and now now I believe that uh, actually the process is unitary I wouldn't actually draw this it's more like what Carol was saying I think I would say it's just it never goes up in a certain sense so I want to explain to you why I changed my mind and what it has to do with ADS CFT oh uh, no but before I do that I should explain why the firewall results from this picture so suppose for whatever reason which we'll get into uh, the page curve is the right description then what does that mean about conditions near the horizon well it means that as Paige argued once about half of the entropy of the black hole has been evaporated then it better be that the next radiation that comes out is entangled with the earlier radiation because you can't purify a state think of this collection of all the early radiation halfway through the evaporation it's a completely mixed state in order to purify it it has to be entangled with a bunch of other stuff and you only have it half as much entropy again left so it must be sort of maximally entangled with all the radiation that comes out once you're halfway through because entanglement is a kind of resource that can't be you know squandered it's only because there's other stuff there that to entangle with that the entropy could go back down so it must be that the uh, we must have the late radiation entangled with the early radiation you know to get the page curve can it be done with something else in addition you mean another asymptotic feature inside the black hole uh, just, just something else no further well, the early radiation is in a mixed state, so it needs to be entangled with something else. Can this early radiation be entangled with something else? Ah. Uh, something else. Uh, yeah, that is sort of like what I'm going to be heading towards, but let's see what you think after. Um, the problem with this is that if we picture this here as one of the say a particular late Hawking radiation photon I already said at the beginning it's all it's entangled with a partner inside the black hole horizon this is at the level of a semi-classical description of quantum field theory on this background it's, I can analyze this at some scale large compared to the Planck length but small compared to the black hole size and I see that the vacuum state has this entangled structure so if this outside mode is entangled with the early radiation actually it can't also be entangled with the inside entanglement gets used up there's a monogamy of entanglement which is captured in something called the strong subadditivity of um, entropy so this is just a property of quantum mechanical states on a tensor product of Hilbert spaces if we have uh, let's call this um, let's see how do I do this this will be a this will be B and the early radiation that's already come out I'll call E for early and so the argument goes that we have uh, some of the some piece of the Hilbert space of the fields can be thought of as a tensor product of the early radiation Hilbert space the B Hilbert space and the A Hilbert space and so then uh, we look at states on that structure H A tensor H B tensor H E and uh, consider any quantum state including a mixed state um, 
on this tensor product. There's something you can prove, let's write it this way, which is that if you reduce to the AB system, and you can compute the entropy of that, or reduce to the BE system, and compute the entropy of that, then the entropy, the sum of those two is greater than or equal to the A entropy plus the E entropy. So let me write that down. S A B plus S B E is greater than or equal to S B plus S E. Sorry. Is that what I wanted to say? No. S A. So the idea of this is that if you just take A by itself, it may have some entropy, E by itself, but some of that entropy may be due to A being entangled with B, and some of E's entropy may be in due to entangling with B. So if we include the B part with A and the B part with E, you might think that you could decrease the entropy compared to just the entropy of A and the entropy of E, because you're taking into account those correlations. The problem is, any given sort of piece of B can only be entangled with either A or E. It can't be entangled with both. So in fact, by including B, you're not going to do better at, if anything, you'll do worse. That is, the total entropy of AB plus BE is greater than or equal to the entropy of A plus the entropy of E. So if we need the entropy um, of BE to be smaller than the entropy of E, because we're trying to make this curve, you know, turn around and come down. What does that imply? If, uh, let's see, the entropy of BE, we want that to be smaller than the entropy of E. Well, then the entropy of AB must be greater than the entropy of A. Otherwise, there's no way we could satisfy this inequality. So let's write that, that uh, S yeah, S B E is less than S E, then implies that S A B is greater than S A. Now that's exactly what we don't have. This is saying that uh, by including A and B together, you have more entropy than just having A by itself. But what we think we know about the state is that A and B are perfectly entangled and there's no entropy at all in AB. And by leaving out B, uh, we would get actually more entropy, not less. So this, is, this actually implies that we don't have this state. But this state is the vacuum state. So this implies that we don't have the vacuum. In fact, we have broken the correlations that are supposed to be there in the vacuum so we must have, in fact, not the vacuum, but a very excited state. So this implies firewall. Notice, I could have made this argument for every single mode that comes out halfway through the evaporation. Yeah, I'm a little confused. Uh, so can it be that B is very much entangled to A, but not perfectly, and very few entangled to E. Is the, or is it if A and B are entangled, then there is zero entanglement between B and E? Um, because if I'm in a state which is not exactly the vacuum, but a state very close to it, so I lose a little bit of uh, entanglement. But a little bit is Would not. This violate the uh, subadditivity? Nothing can violate the subadditivity. It's just an algebraic yeah, no, no, result. I mean, what I mean is, if I just this state I'm in my mind trying to build, does is this impossible because of this mathematical theorem? Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I follow. But like in a slightly different state. Uh, I don't think that'll help because we, in order to have S B E actually less than S E. So for B to partly purify E, we need SAB to be greater than SA. 
So in fact, it doesn't help to include B. If B and A were entangled, I guess it's that, um, allow that three of them be entangled, just not so much as yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. The problem is, though, it needs to be basically maximum. Yeah, I guess I haven't given a full argument. In order to restore the entropy, to make the entropy curve go back down to zero, we have to basically completely entangle every new Hawking quantum with the previous ones, because that's the resource we have. Basically, we have a, one half of the total entropy is out here. This system has to have the same amount of I don't know what it is, like potential entropy. <laughs> the same number of degrees of freedom to completely entangle with all of that stuff to restore its purity. But I think you're right that I didn't argue that explicitly. All I said was this can't be the ground state, in fact, because this has to be greater than zero, not even zero, greater than SA. But quantitatively, you find it, better, it you basically can't you have to have an, you know, at least an order unity deviation from the vacuum entanglement, which means that it's a very excited state. Okay. So the distinction between B and E is that E is an early time thing. Right. B is a late time thing. They're saying B is correlated with A. A is inside the Right. What is E correlated? The only distinction between B and E is the quantum Well, system. in the analysis of quantum field theory in a, a curved space time, each of these E quanta had a partner inside the black hole that it was entangled with. And they, whatever, they fell into the singularity or something. But that's what it's entangled with according to that description. And, and that's not anywhere in the picture. Right. Well, we could have drawn a picture with the E partner sitting in here but they never come out, presumably. I mean, that's another alternative. Some people say maybe they, they do eventually come out. So if the black hole somehow could evaporate down to almost nothing and then in some explosive event, uh, all the information in these correlations between E and its partners you know, is restored. That would be another way that it could work. But the problem is that you would have almost no energy at the end. A tiny black hole with almost no energy would have to store an entropy equal to the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And it couldn't get that information out with that much energy unless it just took an extremely long time. So there is this scenario called the long-lived remnant where it just sort of sits there for eternity almost and trickles out these partners that somehow got stuck. Yeah, and actually that's not, logically that doesn't disagree with this at all. That could be the case. But nobody basically takes it seriously. It, it contradicts um, ADS-CFT because it would represent a state with almost no entropy and a huge, en sorry, energy and a huge entropy. And, uh, well, there is no such state in the CFT that the ADS theory is dual to. So th I think that's the reason for the bias against that resolution. But it's a logical possibility. Did you have a follow-up? Are you going to detail why this implies the parallel? Yeah, just, no, I'm not going to detail it more than I said. It's just that A, S, A, B should be zero in the vacuum. And in fact, it can't be zero. In fact, it must be greater than the entropy of SA by itself, which is that thermal entropy of this pair. So um, it's an order unity excitation from the vacuum. Yeah, I guess I'll say one more thing about it. Remember, I, I'm wanting to analyze this using a formula like this that comes from quantum field theory and curved space-time. So I, I don't want to be talking about Planck scale degrees of freedom where maybe I don't know the description. So I keep this box sufficiently big. I conclude now that the state of A and B is not the, not the one I have described here. But then that means if I trace that state backwards in time, B goes towards the horizon and blue shifts. A goes towards the horizon and blue shifts. And, but they're not in the ground state. 
So that means I have a, an extremely blue shifted excitation, not in the ground state, and that's my firewall. But exactly where the description breaks down, nobody knows. So. Does it make sense to ask the question? You know, Lawrence and Barrett, what would Lawrence and Barrett do? The, uh, I think the attitude of um, the firewall argument is that there's a global rest frame defined by the black hole and somehow it globally enforces this presence of a firewall at a location that depends on this global rest frame. But, but the argument heavily rely on, the, on this blue shift, right? The, the transplankian... So the fact that it must be... question transplankian problem. Well, you don't have to transcend the Planck scale to already conclude that you have a very high energy density. What happens... Yeah, the blue shift has to be very dense. Has to be very large to say that you have a large energy density. Say that any order unity departure from the Uber vacuum will in fact trace back in time to a high, highly excited state. Yeah, but I think that's just, that's a reliable argument before you get into Planck scale. Of course, Planck scale in what frame? I would take the freely falling frame that starts at rest in the black hole rest frame. I don't know what it is. Nobody who presents the argument claims to calculate, you know, what is the right frame? and What is the right distance at which the energy density has a certain value? They only argue that there must be such a frame because of this because the state can't be the vacuum. There are lots of ways to not be the vacuum, so. If there is such a frame, could it then alter the, the, the description of the field theory in the sense that you will become to have a non-locally large invariant theory and this, and this will alter also the picture of the entanglement, the local structure of the vacuum? Well, if the, if it's... The UV is still one, you start being... Well, I think that's sort of what the conclusion is of the firewall argument, that you have a, you don't have the vacuum that you might expect from the equivalence principle, and you have some very excited state. Uh, at some radius, from the black hole it starts. Some function of radius, I guess. Now there's a logical contradiction in the argument because suppose we conclude that, this, that there's this firewall. Then the starting point of the argument that led to this state and the whole Hawking effect is violated. The basis of the Hawking calculation was that we have the vacuum, which has this structure. Now we conclude that we don't have the vacuum but then, then we have no right to believe in the Hawking effect. Well, we, then we need to find a different reason to believe in the Hawking effect. So, it's suspicious. Nevertheless, I think what's interesting and important about this is not that it's, you know, right, but that we have to figure out what's wrong with it if we believe in unitarity. Now the obvious reaction to this that I would have had until fairly recently and that many people still have is, look, the whole problem is arising because we believe irrationally that the entropy should come back down and black hole evaporation should be unitary. What if it's just not unitary? Then everything's fine. There's no firewall. The black hole evaporates away completely. Maybe inside, you know, there's a singularity. We can't just, we don't know the physics there, but Quantum gravity knows it, and uh, maybe there's a bounce, who knows, but it doesn't matter, and there's no firewall conclusion. So this is really only an issue if you believe that the evaporation must be unitary. So the next thing I want to do is explain why you should believe that it is unitary. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen? Uh-oh. Okay, so good. So I avoided having to give my resolution. <laughs> Um, so why should you believe it's unitary? So it's based on, my personal mind was changed by an argument that Don Maroff gave, which is that diffeomorphism invariance
implies what he called boundary unitarity. And somehow boundary unitarity is supposed to probably all you need for this um, argument to apparently work. So the way the argument works is simplest to say in asymptotic anti desitter boundary conditions instead of uh, flat, so I'm going to use that. So this is the boundary of space time. And um, we can cut space time with a spatial slice, sigma, and write the Hamiltonian of our full quantum gravity theory as an integral over the bulk plus a boundary term. HB for boundary. And the bulk integral, because of the diffeomorphism symmetry, is a linear combination of constraints that generate the diffeomorphisms. So it's some lapse and shift and mu uh, contracted with constraints C mu. And I'm going to leave off hats, but I'm thinking of this whole thing as operators in some ultraviolet completion of general relativity that preserves the diffeomorphism invariance of the theory. So we suppose that exists. Maybe it's string theory, maybe it's loop quantum gravity, maybe it's something else. So physical observables in such a theory must be diffeomorphism invariant. Yes? What if diffeomorphism invariance would supposedly, uh, just if it breaks down at Planck scale, say, I'm assuming we have diff no, but I'm assuming we have diffeomorphism in there. Yeah, I know. I'm, ju I'm just wondering if if it were only emergent above the Planck scale, would it screw the argument? Uh, yeah, this argument really assumes exact diffeomorphism invariance. I think so. Um, observables should be invariant under diffeomorphisms, which translates into the fact that they should commute with the constraints. So the time derivative of any observable uh, which is the commutator with the Hamiltonian is just the commutator with the boundary part of the Hamiltonian. So what Merrill notes is that um, if we consider just those observables that can be observed at the boundary, which includes observables that characterize what was thrown in to make a black hole and what comes out when the black hole evaporates. So it's the S matrix observables are included in the boundary observables. That those observables, like all, will, will evolve in time by commutator with the boundary Hamiltonian but in general relativity, I mean, in a generally covariant theory, this boundary Hamiltonian, well, it's at the boundary. It is a boundary observable. It commutes with these because it's time independent and it lives at the boundary, so it's a boundary observable. So what this is telling us is that the algebra of all boundary observables evolves into itself by this unitary evolution equation. Unitary because HB is Hermitian. So the boundary observables evolve unitarily, and that's boundary unitarity. This is not to say that all the observables in the theory are boundary observables. In fact, you could imagine a spacetime that doesn't have a boundary, but is diffeomorphism in, in a diffeomorphism invariant theory, presumably there are observables, and there's no boundary. So there may be other observables here that aren't captured by the boundary observables, but we don't care for Merrill's argument. We still have boundary, the boundary observables evolve unitarily. There could even be another boundary inside here, inside the space-time, maybe outside the singularity or the black hole or something. Boundary prime. And that would lead to another term in this kind of equation, maybe, but 
that won't change the fact that observables, as long as they observables on this boundary commute with observables on this boundary, that the evolution of these observables would be unitary. Anyway, this is this argument. It's very general. It's very sketchy. You can clearly move stuff from one boundary to the other boundary. You what? You can clearly move stuff. You can send stuff from one boundary. Sure. To boundary. Right. So just, you can say the single boundary, but it's not unitary. No, but it's somehow this is telling you it still is. Look, I mean, the moment you throw a particle in from the boundary, you might think, okay, I lost that information, um, but this is telling you, no, you didn't. All right, say we have a space-time with no other boundary, no black hole, no nothing except one. So we can generalize the theory so we can inject particles from the boundary. So I inject this particle. The boundary observer knows the particle was injected because somehow it's an observable, you know, whatever happened there that was the injection process is characterized by a boundary observable. Now that the particle has left, um, somehow there's something still measurable at the boundary that tells you all the same information about this particle what type of particle it was, what its spin was, whatever, momentum and mass, it's all available according to this argument. How could that be true? Well, remember the whole argument hinged on the observables commuting with the constraints and the constraints, again, generating diffeomorphisms. So for the constraints to hold in the classical theory, one of the things that implies is, the, um, is Newton's law of gravity. So somehow what's going on here is that the gravitational influence of this particle is felt at the boundary. And based on that influence, there's enough information in the boundary observable algebra to not have lost any information about what happened to this particle. Now suppose I send another particle in and it collides with this one. So I say this is in a pure state. Uh, and they collide there. So I have particle one, two, three, and four. So this is supposed to be a little like baby analog of a black hole. So let's say one and two are in a pure state. They collide and after the collision three and four are entangled with each other in a quantum mechanically entangled state and the boundary on this slice of the boundary I guess I'll use red. Particle four is still deep inside the space-time. So the boundary observer has only seen particle three arrive and it's entangled with four. So how could the state of the boundary observables have evolved unitarily? It looks like there's some missing information, the entanglement of three with four. But again, just as I said before, that when one leaves the boundary, there's still a memory of it there somehow. There has to also be a knowledge of four at the boundary before four actually reaches the boundary. And the, the nature of this, the boundary deformation that describes the fact that four is there and on the way out is mysterious, but it was studied way back at the beginning of ADS CFT um, under the name, and it was given a name, namely the precursors. The state of four, the state of the kind of image of four at the boundary before four arrives is called the precursor. S Suskind, uh, Tumbas, and Polchinski uh, started off that analysis of these precursors. And they're interesting states. They're very strange states of the boundary. They're non-local. They have uh, no, you can even, they can have zero expectation value of the stress energy tensor. They can be undetectable by any local measurement, but there's some global deformation, sort of like a squeeze state of the vacuum. Um, and I can give you references if you're interested. So what you have to think of is that there is this precursor information of four available at the boundary. How 
this implies that their Hamiltonian is, is zero. So is it associated with the ground state? I'm not saying this no. the stress energy tensor of the whole yeah it's um there are configurations where over a lot of the boundary it's a non-local state that deviates from the vacuum but it's a state in which the expectation value of the stress tensor is zero for over a large piece of the boundary not the whole boundary also yeah so I shouldn't say I didn't mean to imply that the entire boundary has zero uh, expectation everywhere. Oh, so it's not exactly zero everywhere. Right, although I think it's not clear that it couldn't be. I mean, um, can't we have a state in quantum field theory where the expectation value of the stress tensor is zero everywhere, but it's not the vacuum? But you would have either have a degenerate vacuum or you need negative energy states? No? Um, that would be my guess. Um, yeah, I guess if because we could write the Hamiltonian in terms of the integral of the stress tensor in the boundary theory. Yeah, it can't be it can't be the zero everywhere. It's just can be zero over large regions where the state is nevertheless not the vacuum. So we have to be on our toes and aware that there are these degrees of freedom in the boundary that are mysterious. They're in the boundary observable algebra. They're somehow related to the bulk by the gravitational constraint equations. And there's something like the deformation of the multipole moments of the space-time due to the presence of the other particle in the bulk. And it has to be included to understand how boundary unitarity could work. So let's apply that to the black hole now. How much time do I have left, uh, Tomas? Not much. Should I go one hour max? Uh, the thing is, I don't know if there is a talk in this room after us. If there isn't, Ooh. of course you could continue, but if there is, I don't think. you think there isn't? I think there is more time. Okay, okay. Then, then go ahead. Well, I'll try to just end it for anyway. So, uh, this part I think is completely solid, well, solid in this general conceptual setting. That if you buy the basic concept of a diffeomorphism invariant quantum gravity theory, then there should be this boundary observable algebra. It evolves unitarily, and it has some strange non-local degrees of freedom that store in information in, in surprising and unexpected ways. I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, diffeomorphism invariance is something I can always introduce, right? I mean, give me a theory, I can make diffeomorphism invariance by adding more degrees of freedom and uh, mm -hmm. know, constraints, potential, and so on and so forth. So I don't know how, how it can imply it's some sort of redundant symmetry and it seems to be implying something implying something fundamental. So that confuses me. I mean I take a standard scalar tensor theory line Gordon equation. I add the constraint of the Riemann tensors to vanish and that's the homomorphism invariant theory technically. But but I mean it's fundamentally different from general relativity for instance. So how can such a trivial symmetry imply something fundamental like boundary unitary? Um, would it still imply boundary unitarity in that theory? I mean, based on the presentation you've given, it seems that it would, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. There has to be an answer to, but I haven't thought about it. Like I, it affect the observable of the boundary? Here in this argument, you don't really know what are those observable. It might be that if you force hypomorphism and variance, the observable you give are actually completely trivial. It might be, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Also, what and is the nature of this constraint? Does that matter at all? I mean, you're writing the Hamiltonian as a, as a, as a sum of constraints. Does it matter if you're first class constraints, second class constraints, or does it any? Maybe it would be actually, you know, I said that this still allows there to be a lot of bulk observables. I'm just talking about the boundary observables. Maybe it would turn out in that case that there are very few boundary observables. In fact, yeah, that's actually a good time to say the following thing. What is the nature of these boundary observables? How many are there? Maybe there's almost none. The total energy is a boundary observable. And maybe the angular momentum, is that it? So the beauty of ADS-CFT duality from this point of view is that if you 
it seems to be exactly a description of this boundary unitarity where the the boundary observable algebra is identified with the observables of this super yang mills theory at the boundary of ads i, I think that the, the problem is that you're imposing on top of that that your observables satisfy the symmetry yeah you're defining as observables that so yeah the theory where you know, you've actually bootstrapped your way in a diffeomorphism and variance. I don't know. I don't know why you would have to make this assumption. Yeah, that's true too. So, so I mean, think an example like Horava gravity. I mean, if you if you think that your observables are fundamentally in some preferred foliation, then you don't have to make this assumption, even though you could actually write the theory right. in a violent way and have Hamiltonian, which has exactly the same yeah. that you wrote. So, I mean, it appears that uh, if we can, if to the extent that we believe ADS-CFT duality, that we have been incredibly rich in the case of, in the case where the UV completion of, of GR in the appropriate dimensions is this uh, super string theory, the boundary of observable algebra is this super Yang-Mills theory with a very large number of colors. And that's an extremely rich theory, and a lot is known about the nature between the relation between those boundary observables and the bulk. So we can use that for some intuition, even though the basic structure of the argument doesn't depend on, you know, superstring theory being the UV completion or the only one. So that's just to indicate that there could be a very rich uh, theory of the boundary observables. It's clear that in the context of ads CFT, you can create a black hole inside. Yeah, I think that is clear. Well, you, why not? I mean, we know that you can have... It looks like a black hole for a very long time, but actually it's eventually... Oh, yeah. There's also this search back there, people who say that... Right. ...the states that black holes can pose off are smooth geometries. Right. We know that we can send part. We can. We know that we can attach something to the boundary of the theory that allows us to send particles in and suck them out, and we know that we can send them in and make them collide such that, given standard semi-classical physics, they would form a black hole. And we know that what happens in the boundary in that case is that it be, you get what looks like a thermal state, even though it might be pure microscopically. So that's about what we know. I mean, then calling it a black hole, actually, you know, what it is actually, that's a separate question. Like all questions about local bulk observables are problematic or not understood fully in this ADS-CFT. But as an S-matrix kind of process, we certainly understand what it means to send particles in that would make a black hole according to semi-classical criteria. <laughs> Okay, so I should try to um, just connect this back to the firewall and then maybe wrap it up. So instead of sending in two particles that just collide and come back out, what if we send in two particles that make a black hole? Then uh, what does this all have to say about the firewall and the entanglement and the entropy and all that? So let's draw next to this the experiment again. So we're going to make these guys, like what I was just saying, have a, you know, these could be very high energy and with a small impact parameter and they're, we know that each one separately is well described semi-classically according to the duality, so presumably something has to happen like a black hole in here. And then we can look at Hawking radiation that comes out. Let's say here's sort of our first Hawking quantum that comes out to the boundary. Now to actually set up this scheme with this time-like boundary, we have to put boundary conditions here and they turn out to be, in the case of ADS-CFT, they're reflecting boundary conditions. So if we don't do anything else, generally this particle will just bounce off and fall back in. But we can couple the boundary to an auxiliary field theory that with some amplitude extracts that energy into this reservoir that a guy named Rocha called the Evaporon Reservoir. So I'll just put it here, Evaporon Reservoir. So it's like a one plus one dimensional quantum field theory that we attach to the boundary. We couple it, let's say, to the S wave mode of one of the bulk fields 
to the boundary value of the S wave mode of one of the bulk fields. And that way, eventually, we just extract all of the energy that's coming out into the evaporon bath. OK, so remember now, if this is a semi-classical space-time, well, let's grant that. Uh, we're going to apply the Hawking analysis here that I mentioned at the beginning and conclude that this represents a quantum field uh, state that's entangled with something behind this horizon. So when it arrives at the boundary, it looks like it should be in a mixed state, and yet we have boundary unitarity. So really, really, ever since we threw this stuff in to form the black hole, the boundary state must be evolving unitarily. And so this must be entangled with something else. This comes back to what you asked at the beginning. Uh, and with something else besides this partner. Now, on the other hand, I argued at the beginning that it's impossible, using this strong subadditivity, for this to be entangled both with its partner and with something else. But that was based on the assumption that the Hilbert space was a tensor product of three factors. And actually, however, our states, if we think in a sort of Schrodinger picture, must be annihilated by this constraint operators. So the actual Hilbert space in quantum gravity is not a tensor product of local factors. It's the kernel of the Wheeler-DeWitt constraint and the other constraints. So these are some quantum operators, and they should annihilate the state. So I might start with a Hilbert space that's a, like a pre-Hilbert space that's a tensor product of the inside and the outside, and maybe the boundary. But after I apply this constraint, I'm going to get some subspace of that. That's the physical, physical state space. And then it's not so clear where information is encoded in that state. It can be encoded in multiple places. And I have a nice example of this uh, to illustrate it. Let's consider an analogy with this, where we have four spin J systems. And our symmetry, instead of diffeo invariance, is going to be global rotational invariance. And the Hilbert space to begin with is the spin J Hilbert space tensor with itself four times. But that's not the physical Hilbert space. I have to take the subspace that's rotationally invariant. So physical states have to satisfy that the total angular momentum operator annihilates the state. And that's supposed to be analogous to this. So which states of the four spin system satisfy this? They have to be singlets. And if you look at how you can make singlets, one way to analyze it is to group these two together by addition of angular momentum. They can add to 0, 1, 2, or anything up to 2j. So 0, 1, 2j. And the same thing with these two spins. And the only way to make a singlet is if these two guys add to the same thing that these two guys add to, and then you combine those two and make a singlet. So I can just draw this line as continuous. And this is just kind of a diagrammatic picture of what's called an intertwiner, which is a singlet in the Hilbert space of these four spin j's and satisfies this condition. So the physical Hilbert space of my little toy theory is the space of intertwiners of these four spins. Now, let's ask where information is stored in this state. So what information there is is which intertwiner we're talking about. And there are 2j plus 1 of those. Now, I could find out which one I'm talking about by measuring this pair of spins. That would already tell me which intertwiner I have. Or I could measure this pair of spins. Or I could even measure this pair of spins, although then I'd be projecting onto non-commuting eigenstates of a non-commuting operator. But uh, the point is that information is distributed through this state in a strange way and multiply encoded. It's a global piece of information about the state, kind of, that characterizes the true gauge in, uh, invariant structure. So I propose that the same thing is true with the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. And these 
diffio constraints, in other words, and that this information that's in this entangled pair is not only available in this pair locally, but it's also available at the boundary because just as this particle, say four, had a precursor image at the boundary, this partner of this Hawking quantum also has a, an image at the boundary. In other words, the whole state has its boundary image, sort of, and that the information, uh, so this, in other words, can be entangled with other boundary degrees of freedom, even though it's also entangled with this, because the Hilbert space is not just a tensor product of those factors. So this was my resolution. Firewall evasion by quantum gravity was basically this idea. And I'm over time, so I won't tell you about why I don't think this is correct anymore. <laughs> No, actually, recently, um, so I thought that Don Maroff would agree with me about this because all I'm using is his concept of boundary unitarity, but he doesn't. He still doesn't see this as an escape from the firewall argument. And I couldn't really understand why not until um, Aaron Wall explained it to me recently. So I could tell you the objection, or I could just stop and we could discuss it privately. But okay. So any, before I do that, I'll take a drink. And are there any questions about this so far? I first thought you could avoid it, but because you're talking about a subspace of the tensor product. But I think you can't if you define these entropies in the same way you do on any tensor product and restrict to some subspace, it's still got to be a true uh, inequality. So I... Is it just a single space? Uh, space of singles? Right. Single space. Yeah. Space. Well, yeah, but it could be realized as a subspace of this tensor product. But I think the point is that um, talking about the entropy I think the entropy of a pair is not an observable in the sense that it would commute with J, the total angular momentum. And so it's kind of maybe true, but irrelevant. It's what we're really concerned about is um, whether there's information in the state that's gauge invariant that has been lost. So I don't know, this is fuzzy in my mind. It's a very good question. I don't know exactly what to say about that. Uh, anything else before? Yes. It seems that the, in the Willard and Witt constraint, the boundary observable are, not, are they involved in this constraint? Um. Or does it couple, so to speak, only the bulk observable among themselves? I think it it goes all the way out to the boundary. So. Boundary observables are like asymptotic values of bulk fields, so I think it, they are involved. Even if you put this boundary condition like in the BS? I think so. Um. Yeah. Okay, so what, what's, it, okay, there's obviously a lot incomplete about this picture, but as a sketch, it looked to me very promising of a possible resolution. But it doesn't seem to have an immediate way of dealing with the following objection. So let's suppose that half the black hole entropy has evaporated and been sucked out into the evaporon reservoir. And that process has basically left the evaporon reservoir in a mixed state because those Hawking quanta, while they might have been entangled with other boundary degrees of freedom, like these mysterious precursor degrees of freedom, those mysterious precursors are not by themselves 
being sucked out into the evaporon reservoir. The coupling between that reservoir and the boundary is through local operators that can be thought of as detecting the presence of a local quantum. So presumably halfway through, we have developed a situation where the evaporon reservoir is full of a mixed state, like a thermal state of evaporons. And somehow, when we let the evaporation continue down to zero, stuff that comes out later must purify the early evaporons. It's just like we originally had, without thinking about evaporons, the had the early radiation must be purified by the late radiation. Well, now this radiation has been sucked out into the evaporon bath. Even if it might have been entangled with something else at infinity at the boundary, it doesn't help. It does have to be purified by something. And what's available is the, uh, is the rest of the radiation that comes out. So um, what Marolf said and what Aaron Wall explained to me Marolf was saying was that it seems like the late Hawking radiation by that argument must be entangled with the evaporon reservoir. And therefore, back to the beginning of the argument, it can't be entangled with its partner behind the horizon. Now, I think this so therefore, we were back to the original problem and nothing has been solved. That was his basic complaint. I think that what's missing from that is what happens when a Hawking particle propagates from the horizon to the boundary. Because let me ask you to think about this whole process just from the point of view of the boundary as in ADS-CFT, the boundary field theory. We heat up this super yang mills theory to some temperature T. That's, that's what corresponds to forming a black hole. It's not really temperature because it's not really a mixed state. We're assuming it's a pure state. But it's one of those pure states that looks like a thermal state because you're not keeping track of uh, very fine-grained correlations. And then we start extracting energy from this quasi-thermal state and putting it into the evaporon reservoir. And then halfway through, we still have all these non-local degrees of freedom that are thermally excited as well as the local degrees of freedom. Eventually, once we cool this field theory down to the vacuum state again, both the local and non-local degrees of freedom have to lose all of their energy. They, everything has to go down to the ground state, because if we cool it to the ground state. So at some point, what happens is that there's, um, it's not like the non-local uh, precursor degrees of freedom are decoupled. They have to give up their energy back to those degrees of freedom that are being sucked out into the reservoir. And therefore, they really are talking to the reservoir because we're going to lower the temperature down to zero. So, um, so the resolution is that it's, if we ignore the process of these non-local degrees of freedom at the boundary, coupling back in to the evaporon reservoir, then we're missing part of the story. And so it need not be the late Hawking quanta uh, by themselves that purify the evaporons. It's the entire boundary state. And the entire boundary state includes information about the early precursors and the late precursors of these partners. And if you think I sound like a crazy person, <laughs> um, this is what the problem calls for. We have a very strange situation here in theoretical physics where People are convinced that there's no escape from the conclusion that a black hole has a firewall. And these aren't crackpot people. These are serious arguments based on aspects of physics we think we believe, not huge extrapolations. And so uh, desperate measures are called for if we're going to save black holes. And I feel like the sane thing is to save black holes. Because if, look, I mean, if you lose a black hole, a macroscopic large black hole in the center of our galaxy has, has to have a firewall. I mean, that sounds completely insane. So 
course, it's not halfway through its evaporation, so that might be an escape from that one, but. So that's about it. I, I think that, you know, we have to take totally seriously what are the true observables of a diffeomorphism invariant theory. What are the degrees of freedom at infinity that are very, very non-classical and subtle, non-local degrees of freedom that are part of this story? And what is the kind of uh, actual nature of the Hilbert space that we should be talking about? And I guess I have faith, like religious faith, that in the end, if we could get that right, there would be no, far, no need for a firewall. And the reason it's useful to think about is that maybe we learn something about quantum gravity on the way. That's all. Thanks very much, so, I'm uh, sorry about going on too long. We had some questions during the talk. Yeah. So those of you that want to escape, would escape now, then we will continue the, uh, the rest of us. OK. So let's see if anybody has questions. Um, you are saying that the environment is, is, I mean, the environment, what you call here, is, is a huge space, right? Maybe wouldn't it make sense to think of it as decomposed as a lot of separate, possibly disconnected regions? Wouldn't that change the arguments? I mean, if the information doesn't come together again, you know what I mean? Then maybe the entropy doesn't have to go back to zero because there is just no such observer that can collect all the information back together. Oh, yeah. Um. Right, I mean, if you, don't, if you don't embrace the boundary unitarity argument or something like it, then you don't really have a question to answer. I think we need to believe that it makes sense to insist on, well, it makes sense to believe in some form of unitarity for the asymptotic observer. Um, and you could, if you're insistent, you could say, well, Marolf's argument is very formal, um, and ADS-CFT is just about string theory and I'm not going to worry about it and black hole ev evaporation is not unitary, so. But I would think of an asymptotic observer as being asymptotically far away in one direction. I mean, how can I see the, the whole... Uh, well, no, but, yeah, if you, if you only look at a part of it, of course, you're not going to face the puzzle. So, but th the interesting thing is to look at the whole thing and then see that you have a puzzle. Well, okay, but maybe... There's no such observer that could do that, even not uh, theoretically. I don't see why there wouldn't be, but... I don't know, because it's, they are causally disconnected. Well, I mean, certainly the way quantum field theory works in curved space-time is we just have a Hilbert space associated with a complete space-like slice. You're proposing to give that up. Um, I'd want a good reason to give it up, or its quantum gravity version. No, well, a space like slice is fine. Okay, I don't see why it's enough. Other questions? I have a general question. We have ADS CFT, so why do we have to argue all this? Why not calculate? <laughs> <laughs> right, we have ADS CFT, which is quantum gravity inside, so why don't Right, so what you would have to calculate is, um, you'd have to know what it meant, what operator in the field theory, let's say, by calculate I suppose you mean use the Yang-Mills theory. So we'd have to know what is the observable in the Yang-Mills theory that describes the experiences of a observer who falls across the black hole horizon. And that's what's not really understood at this point, so. Um, but you're right, in principle, it should be possible. You mean to just test. Yeah. Of course, uh, suppose you calculated it. You could, and suppose you found nothing special happens and there's no firewall. But you'd still want to know what's, what's wrong with the firewall argument. I mean, th the most interesting thing about the whole thing, I think, is to learn what's wrong with the argument, because that will tell us something about quantum gravity. And so even finding this observable was regular wouldn't answer that question directly. Do you want more questions? So, 
just a person who doesn't believe in string theory have any reason to believe in fireworks? I think so, based on Maroff's argument. It seems to be based on some sort of ADS CFT. No, it, the way I presented it, it was based on using asymptotic anti desitter boundary conditions, if that's what you mean. But it didn't assume what was the nature of the UV completion of this diffeomorphism invariant gravity theory. So it assumed there is some well-defined uh, diffeomorphism invariant quantization of the theory, but it didn't say what it is. So I don't think you need to believe string theory. As far as the asymptotic anti de Sitter, that's sort of just a convenience. Merrill also gave an argument for asymptotically flat boundary conditions. It's just uh, trickier to explain. Um, and also, it's really more, it gives an argument for unitarity of the S matrix between scry minus and scry plus. But for my purposes, I like to think about this uh, continuous boundary unitarity, because I think it's conceptually helpful. So that's why I stuck to this case.